Today is uh, May 26th, 2022. We're here interviewing uh, Bob Brown, uh, who was a member of the 121st Tactical Fighter Wing. I think it was Tactical Fighter Group at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see, it was, it was either Fighter Group and or the Wing. It changed. Yeah, it changed somewhere in there. But anyway, uh, you, you're uh, 91 now, and you turn uh, 92, I guess, uh, next week on uh, May 31st. Right. But uh, I wanted to ask you first off, uh, um, wh where were you born and where were you raised at? Well, I was actually born in a little town called Pinckneyville, Illinois. And what year was that? 1930. Okay. Southwest, it was southeast of St. Louis. And I don't remember a thing, <laughs> because when I was several months old, we moved to Marysville, Pennsylvania, which is just on the east side of Pittsburgh. Okay. And then from there, we went to Evans City, Pennsylvania, up north of Pittsburgh, and then down to Westview, just north of Pittsburgh, and that's about well, from Evan City to Westview when I was five, six years old, and that's when I can start remembering things. Yeah. And what, what year did you first come to Columbus, Ohio? Uh, came to Columbus in, uh, when I got out of the Air Force in the fall of 1955 because I wanted to join the Guard to help make a living <laughs> and take a GI Bill and finish college at Ohio State. That way I could go as a resident for reduced fees. So, I had been at Bus Kingdom College over here in New Concord, but I was paying for that. Okay. All my folks were. So what uh, what year did you join the 121st? Well, that would have been in the fall of 1955. Okay. I was drafted, I got a draft notice my junior year at Bus Kingdom, applied for a deferment, it was denied, so at the end of my junior year, I had to go into, well, it was late to go into the Army with the draft. However, I walked into the Air Force recruiting office, told them I wanted to sign up as an aviation, for the Aviation Cadet Program. Okay. The greatest thing that happened to me is they called out the recruiting office officer there was a first lieutenant with a pair of wings on that had been grounded. I hung on to him. <laughs> he got me away from the Army and into the Air Force. All right. I know he pulled some strings. When you joined the uh, 121st, uh, what aircraft did you fly? Well, I'd been flying F-84 F model at uh, Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. Okay. And then what were they flying in the 121st? The same thing? Uh, no. I think they had the E model or the, they had the E model of the F-84. Okay. And then how long did you fly that aircraft? Oh gosh, it was a couple of years. Well, let's see, that would have been, we also got the G model. Okay. That was the one that had the refueling capability. Oh, okay. Uh, some of it on the tip tanks for those probes. Uh -huh. You had to put a tip tank into the, into the tank or probe by probe and drogue. Then the later models of the G had the door that opened up on top of the wing where they would put the boom in. You just had to fly formation. Okay. Out of the stick it stuff. And then, um, when did you guys transition to the F-100? Well... You, you were overseas, I think, in the F-84, no, is that correct? Well, or? the, 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 uh, the wing went to, and, one, and the F-166 went to France on the Berlin recall. They went to Etain, France. But there were two squadrons still left here in Ohio, one in Springfield and one at Mansfield. Okay. With no, no wing support. However, they needed support in France rather than just a squadron all by itself. And, and was this the Berlin crisis that was going on? This Is was that... the Berlin 
contingency, they called it, in 1961. Okay. So what they decided to do was to divide the wing headquarters into three groups. Okay. The experienced people, the middlers, kind of in between, and then the uh, people who did not have as much time and as much capability and proficiency in their AFSCs. So they took the junior, the lower group of people and the senior people and they left what we call the middlers here. And I just happened to be one of those. I was a captain at the time and I think I was in the command post. Okay. Because we still had Springfield and Mansfield uh, here and they needed the normal wing support and supply and medical and operation and all that sort of stuff. And when did you transition to the F-100s? Well, <clears throat> when they completed in, uh, it was, I think it was spring, summer of 1962, they decided to form uh, F-84F squadrons in France because some of the units had sent the airplanes to uh, uh, Germany and Belgium and Netherlands and Germans also had F-100s and there was some interchange between the 166th in France and those units over in Germany. So okay. that, then they brought that a, uh, a group that was coming home from uh, down in Tunisia, I believe it was, in North Africa. Mm -hmm. And they just said, you're going back, you're going to leave the airplanes, and the only thing you take home is state-owned property. In other words, there's a desk. If you brought that over here from Ohio, take it back to Ohio with you. If it was here when you got here, leave it here. <laughs> but, but the planes were left too then, right? The planes were left. They brought in a former deputy wing commander who coincidentally was wing commander when I was in Bangor, Maine in 1953 and 54. Huh. Earl Coward. <laughs> and he, he walked in, he looked. He says, don't I know you? I said, yes, sir. You flatter me, you know me. I was with you in the 506th up at Dow Air Force Base. And everybody went, whoa, yeah. <laughs> what a coincidence. Yeah. Here it was all that time later. Now, moving forward a little bit, in 1968, the F-100s were deployed to uh, Korea in the Pueblo crisis, is that correct? That's correct. And, and how did you get there, you know, from, from Ohio? We flew the airplanes all the way across the Pacific. Wow, and did they you... They call it uh, Fox Peter. Okay. That's, uh, Peter stands for the Pacific. Uh, the F-84s that went to France in 61, they called that a Fox Abel across the Atlantic. Oh, okay. But it wasn't near as far. Yeah. And we left here 10 o'clock one morning, seven in-flight refuelings wow. between here and Hawaii, 10 hours and 45 minutes, sitting on a raft, because <laughs> that's what was your seat cushion that sat underneath you and your parachute was attached to that. So we had seven refuelings, 10 hours and 45 minutes, and we got there at something like two o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And we had to stay awake. And what? how did you get, did you stop in Hawaii first and then on right. to? We stayed overnight in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. The next day was seven and a half hours with I think four refuelings, and we went to Guam, to Anderson Air Force Base. Okay. That was a two or three hour difference. Then the next day we went from Guam, 
crossed the international date line, and I think we had two or three refuelings, and we had to arrive for some we had way more fuel than we needed, because they had a local practice there that all arriving aircraft of any kind had to have at least one hour of fuel remaining. Okay. So we flew around and took a look at the country of Korea. And what what base were you at in Korea? And was it close to the DMZ or? Uh, it's about, well, let's see, it was about a hundred and, well, we were about 90 miles south of Seoul. And that was about 30 more, so it was about 125, 150 miles south of the DMZ. And how long were you in that, Korea? We were in there almost a year. Wow. We sat alert with four airplanes. We escorted the EC-130s that flew up and down the DMZ. Okay. Called it Commando Royal for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but we would put four airplanes on them and keep sending one of them 20, 30 miles south to refuel so that everybody kept topped off on fuel. And uh, how long did you stay in the uh, 121st Air Refueling Wing, or uh, not Air Refueling Wing, Tactical Fighter Wing, I guess. <laughs> Went to an Air Refueling Wing later on, but... Uh, well, after we came back in the summer of uh, 69, that I stayed until uh, March of 1973, so that was roughly four more years. And uh, you retired as a lieutenant colonel? That's correct. And uh, so you retired right before they got the A-7 aircraft then? Correct. Okay. And after you retired, uh, what what did you do after that? Did you continue working, or I went back to Rockwell. Surprisingly enough, we those of us that went in to come back, uh, we said the only thing that had changed while we were gone was the names and the numbers. Huh. The guy that took over my work while I was gone did an excellent job. He had me back on speed in a day or two. Uh, wow. It was really great going back. And, and what was your job? What, what, what did you do? Well, at that time, I was the uh, project manager for what we called the subcontractor publications to support the RA-5C. You know, the, the manufacturer builds the airplane designs and builds the airplane, makes compartments to put equipment in, like radios and gyros and instruments. Even the, the stick grip <laughs> has electrical connections. The brakes, the landing gear, every part. The manufacturer just makes the body of the airplane. They subcontract all the other stuff out and with the design specs so that it will fit in the airplane when it's assembled, test off, and delivered to the, to the unit. Well, to, to end up the interview, I wanted to read the motto that you uh, gave to me <clears throat> that you said you lived by when you were a pilot. I'm going to read it real quick. It says, the pilots get the glory and they draw the flying pay. They strut around the field and have a lot to say. But I'll tell you a secret and I'll certify it's true that a pilot isn't worth a damn without a good ground crew. Amen. And that's what you live by? That's the way I, that was my philosophy. Wherever I was, flying airplanes. I owe my life to a lot of guys who were dedicated to do the job and do it right. I, I don't think I can remember any time that we were required, of course, to pre-flight the airplane. We had to sign the four and five before we left, and we had pre-flighted it. And I cannot remember aborting an airplane on a pre-flight okay. when I was in the guard. 
Well, thank you for this opportunity to interview you, uh, Bob, and um, thank you for your service, and uh, you're very much appreciated. Well, thank you. Uh -huh.